Roger Williams University. Um, Skylar received her PhD from the University of Maine. Um, and after her PhD, she completed a Knauss Fellowship as well as a NOAA postdoc, uh, postdoc uh, at the Milford Lab. She is heavily involved in science, science communication and is a producer for um, the Story Collider. And now she focuses on um, bivalves and uh, will be telling us all about her work both as a Knauss Fellow and, and her current research. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I know I was originally supposed to give a presentation back in March um, and then the pandemic happened. So uh, let's see, do you guys just see the, yep. you don't see my note screen, right? No. Nope. All right, great. So I figured I would start off um, talking a little bit about myself and my interests briefly and sort of how that led me down the road for the Canals Fellowship. I wanted to talk a little bit about it um, in case there are grad students here that um, are considering a policy experience or a career for that matter. Um, and so I like this Venn diagram that shows uh, really where my interests are. Um, I care a lot about invertebrate biology and ecology a lot. Um, I am really a marine ecologist at heart. I really like working with shellfish and people like harvesters, growers, um, eating them. Uh, I really like that aspect of um, marine invertebrates that I work with. And then I care a lot about uh, human communication and connection. I think that's really important in terms of how we get our science across, we get people to care about it, how we get funded, uh, and also because I actually like people. Um, so I feel like I've done a lot of work in this, this part of the Venn diagram in the past, which is a lot of classic science communication, sharing what you love to people. Um, and then I've also done some work where I've engaged with stakeholders, again, that human connection and then those shellfish folks. Um, and then my research interests are really uh, what I like to write proposals for uh, is this overlap between invertebrate biology and ecology and shellfish and people. And then this part right in the middle, <laughs> this is where you get the human connection, the shellfish growers, that kind of work, the applied science, right? And then our love of invertebrates, biology, and ecology. That middle part is how research management, practices, policies, all that stuff gets done. And it's really where uh, a lot of what my new job as an assistant professor of biology, aquaculture and extension specialist at Roger Williams is gonna be about um, a lot of that box. So during my PhD, I worked on a fishery species, uh, sea scallops, and there are a bunch of things that I noticed. Um, there are a lot of feelings, opinions, and various values expressed at a lot of meetings. Um, there are a lot, a lot of feelings. Um, but those feelings and opinions and values actually really influence how decisions end up being made. Um, it's not just about the facts, unfortunately. And uh, I got really interested in social psychology. Uh, it sort of started learning more about that and the importance of good communication. And one of the things that is well known in um, sociology literature, I guess, is that credibility is equal to your competence uh, and your goodwill and your trustworthiness. So how do you communicate these two um, uh, parts across as a scientist that got me really, really interested. And a lot of these feelings, opinions, values being expressed at industry meetings, that also happens at a bigger level uh, in the larger government scale. And so that kind of led me to get really interested in policy as I really wanted to see how things worked at this upper level scale. And for those that don't know, uh, NOAA Sea Grant offers a marine policy fellowship called the Knauss Fellowship. It's offered to uh, masters and PhD students. Uh, once you've graduated, you can't apply, you usually still have to be in school. So I applied at the end of my PhD. Um, I partly applied because the 2016 election happened, if I'm being honest. I really wanted to get involved in politics to some degree. And I really wanted to understand how government works because for a lot of people who don't have a big background in this, uh, it's kind of just like the man behind the curtain uh, <laughs> in Wizard of Oz. Um, so the Canals Policy uh, Fellowship Program, just to give you a little bit of background, I think these are the latest stats as of this spring. 
there's been over 1,300 fellows since it started in 1979, and 50% of alumni end up working in the federal government. Um, and 934 fellows have been placed in federal departments and agencies, and 417 have been placed in the US Congress. And because I really wanted to understand more about the, um, the sausage of legislation being made, I applied specifically for a congressional or legislative position. And um, I'm gonna talk about a few things I learned, not everything, but one of the things I learned really, really quickly is that lawmaking is really, really complicated. That whole video of like, here's a bill is not what actually happens. Um, and, and maybe more of you are familiar with this anyway from the recent uh, the last four years, but um, it's really complicated and there's a lot of focus on relationships and how um, different parts of Congress are related to each other, not just on a personal level. So the ecologist in me could really only uh, understand this from a certain perspective was I had to make an ecosystem out of it. So I decided that all of Congress is a bit of a community ecology level <laughs> of how things interact. Uh, the individual chambers, the House of Reps and the Senate to me are like separate populations of different species. They have their own dynamics going on. And then each member in the House or the Senate is uh, the whole office, all the people in that office are basically an organism. Uh, that's how I like to think of it as an individual organism. Um, and these pictures are from Beat for anyone that's seen that show. Uh, it's quite hilarious. And the, uh, the staffers of Congress are really like the lifeblood they make everything happen. It's not a perfect analogy because they can move between um, individuals and, and cross species, but, <laughs> but it was sort of a helpful way for me to understand like how, uh, how it all came together and, and worked. Um, some important things I learned in terms of how it relates to science funding and policy is that First, all congressional sessions are only two years, um, and that means that any bill that's not passed during a session has to be reintroduced again the following session, um, and that can be a bit disheartening at time. And only like one to three percent of bills actually pass into law within a session, uh, which is something that I, I guess I hadn't fully understood before I went in there. And bills almost always need to be introduced through a committee first. Um, and that also got me really interested in committees, uh, it, which is actually where I ended up for my position was in a committee. And just as an FYI, all, all tax bills have to originate in the US House of Reps, which is just something to know. In terms of committees, um, there are quite a few. And again, some of you, like maybe the faculty are familiar with all this, but especially for the students, if you're not familiar, um, I've all the committees that have anything to do with science um, I've put in green here um, so these are all the committees if you were writing a letter about a law and you wanted to know who is on what committees these are the kinds of committees that you would be interested in knowing what they're doing what kind of bills they're hearing what kind of bills get passed through them um, and they're divided into standing and special and in the Senate where I did my um, uh, placement. I worked on the Environment and Public Works Committee, which has been around, I think, since the mid 1800s. Um, and it does exactly that. It works on environmental issues and public works, which could include uh, transportation, um, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers bills, um, actually postal offices was a big thing in that office. So sort of a hodgepodge of things, but a lot of environmental work, um, especially with the EPA. Uh, there was a lot of action in my office when um, people were trying to get rid of uh, Scott Pruitt at the EPA, for example. So a little bit more about my office. Um, the Environment and Public Works Committee, I worked in the minority staff for the Democrats and the ranking member, that's the head minority uh, member of a committee was Senator Carper uh, from Delaware, who's still in office. This is a picture of us out in the field on the left here at a uh, site in Delaware, um, and that's me. And then here's a picture during um, one of our hearings where we're staffing Senator Carper, who's out of the site in this picture, but um, here I am. 
uh, all blurry behind Senator Cardin, who's actually from Maryland. And then with Kristoff, who is a mentor in my office, who's actually a former Sea Grant fellow. They're kind of everywhere in DC. But um, the point is, is I got to have a lot of different experiences, both out engaging with stakeholders because Delaware was really close um, and also doing a lot of um, work in in hearings over overseeing helping oversee certain bills that were being proposed and uh, bills that the senator would introduce and I even got to write a uh, briefing on uh, marine plastics which was pretty cool and one thing I think I like these sort of concept diagrams because it was hard finding any of these actually so I made a bunch myself but uh, on a committee um, you have minority and majority staffs. And so basically, if you work on the committee staff, um, this is where I got to work. We worked with the personal staff, we worked with the member directly, we worked with the other committee, like all their staff. Um, sometimes we even um, uh, interacted with their chair occasionally. And then we also worked with all sorts of member offices in our caucus, the, uh, with the other Democratic offices, but actually we would work sometimes with the Republican offices as well which was pretty, uh, it was just a great experience. We also um, got to uh, do some other cool stuff where um, we got to visit uh, on these congressional trips to go see like bat tagging and catching. Uh, we got invited to a lot of really interesting things like that um, and participated in the Library of Congress congressional staff scavenger hunt. So I just want to highlight some of the fun stuff quickly, but uh, there's just a lot to, it's just so fascinating and interesting um, coming from a mostly research background and um, doing SCICOM on the side. So to sum up some major things I learned in the Senate is bringing scientific facts and observations to your local reps only goes so far. Um, it's important, but it's, it's often not enough uh, because a lot of time they don't even know what to do. They're like, well, that's great but they don't necessarily know what actions need to be uh, taken. So that's um, part of what you should go to your reps with um, if you're interested in doing that kind of thing. It's like knowing how to approach a problem is sometimes more important than the fact that there is a problem. Um, and you, you know, partnering up with NGOs and people who do both the policy and the science together are really good at figuring out ways to, to push for, for certain bills and legislation. And in general, they really like stories um, uh, along with the facts. So uh, again, it's a large complicated ecosystem of relationships, both unofficially and officially. And I found that having a science degree was super, super helpful and very appreciated um, and that they need more people with science degrees working in legislation because you'd be surprised how many people make uh, laws about science that don't have any science background. So. Um, so that's my, my little policy plug. Uh, and the thing is, um, is that having this background was actually very appealing to the Milford lab when they hired me for a postdoc because I had a little bit of understanding at least of um, uh, how the government works, especially how NOAA works because uh, the fellowships through NOAA, so I got to engage with them as an agency quite a bit and really understand actually the importance of relationships with stakeholders um, and government officials. Um, so this is a selfie <laughs> that I took of me and Julie Rose, who is my, um, my postdoc supervisor at the Milford Lab and Mark Dixon, who is one of the best uh, field um, field technicians at Milford. He's been there for decades and he's just so wonderful to work with. Uh, this was actually one of our last field days um, in December 2019 um, in the van where we were doing all our filtering. I'll get to that later. So um, I wasn't sure what kind of background folks here had on um, shellfish aquaculture in New England and uh, so very briefly, like New England has over 1,500 leases, permits, and licenses, and that's for Maine, New Hampshire, um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Uh, this is for marine leases, I believe. And it makes about 45 to $50 million uh, dockside value. Um, and this data that I've found is from 2013, so I'm pretty sure it's increased since then. Um, but oysters are the most valuable of 
of all this aquaculture in New England. Um, and then in the Connecticut in industry, <clears throat> and I'm focusing on this because that's where uh, my postdoc took place um, in Western Connecticut, has over 70,000 acres farmed and usually um, brings about 200,000 bushels of oysters to market. And I looked up, um, cause like, what is a bushel? Uh, <laughs> and it's about, I think 9.3 gallons. So I think of like a gallon milk jug. So it's like 9.3 of those times 200,000. Um, it's probably, it's a lot of milk, it's, but they're oysters instead. So anyway, that's just sort of a visual, <laughs> if you can get that in your head of like how, how many oysters are coming out of Connecticut. And it's worth about $30 million per year uh, That's what the Connecticut Department of Agriculture continues to report, which is a really large proportion of this value up here for all of New England. So it's a really important industry um, uh, within the aquaculture industry of New England. <clears throat> However, there is an industry bottleneck um, and that bottleneck really is access to new leases. Uh, it's a major limiting factor. Um, for example, in Connecticut alone, most of the aquaculture sites are only in the western part of the state and there's really not that many in the eastern part of the state. Um, so I want to introduce two terms uh, as we go, go through what, why this is a limiting factor uh, or why we, we think it's a limiting factor. And so carrying capacity is very important when we're talking about um, access to new sites, right? There's the ecological carrying capacity, um, and these definitions are from Byron et al. 2011. The stocking or farm density, which causes unacceptable ecological impacts. Okay, that makes sense. And then the social carrying capacity is a level of farm development that causes unacceptable social impacts, whatever those may be. Um, and Byron, who did her, her this work in Rhode Island, uh, she graduated from URI, I believe, um, uh, her work was focused in Rhode Island and found that cultured oyster biomass could be increased from the 5% water surface cap without exceeding the ecological carrying capacity because there's a 5% water cap on the ponds, right? And I'm sure most of you are um, familiar with that more so than even I am. Um, but they found that you could increase the biomass by 625 times in Narragansett Bay alone. Uh, which would be 9% of the water surface, and then coastal lagoons, you could increase it by 62 times, um, and it would not exceed the ecological carrying capacity. However, this 5% rule persists, and it's likely due to the social carrying capacity of the system and not the ecological carrying capacity. Um, and for some of you that are familiar with these kinds of issues, um, this may not be a surprise for any, but for anyone that this is new, NIMBY or not in my backyard, um, as we call it, uh, is very common in the US. Uh, it happens um, all over the place, over oyster farms in California, um, like really, really common uh, from Mississippi to Maine. Uh, even last year, the lobster industry in Maine <clears throat> was generally opposed to it or parts of it were anyway. Anyway, there are a lot of opinions about aquaculture that usually come down to social acceptance. That's not to say that there aren't some legitimate concerns, but a lot of the drive uh, does come from people who just don't want it in their backyard for one reason or another. Um, and it's often connected to a social reason. However, um, framing shellfish in terms of ecosystem services potentially could influence coastal communities' perceptions. Um, I know from, from some of um, the work that I just covered in my aquaculture survey course is that there's a, a, a lot of confusion sometimes that about whether or not shellfish farming has the same ecological impact as finfish farming. farming. Um, and they are different and have different impacts and it depends of course on the system as well. But um, understanding the benefits of shellfish uh, could be really helpful. Um, and this is a nice little concept diagram of how uh, bivalves can extract nutrients, which we're gonna continue talking about more. Um, they can improve quality by removing a lot of these nutrients from the water. 
Uh, and water quality resource managers are really interested in a lot of places to include oysters in their nitrogen management plans, right? So um, I assume that a lot of you, a lot of students here are familiar with this problem of getting too much nitrogen and eutrophication, but I'm just gonna sort of walk through it in case anyone's unfamiliar. Um, so nitrogen is a building block for all life, super great. But as coastal populations, human populations in particular, have increased, large amounts of nitrogen are getting washed into our waterways, um, and that's not good. Um, and so without enough grazers to eat the fertilized plants, which is sort of the analogy, right? So you have all this nitrogen input, the phytoplankton populations increase, and this goat is representing symbolically um, the grazers. Uh, so a lot of the filter feeders, right? Uh, we get we get our overgrown yard um, analogy for the waterways. Um, and so this can cause all sorts of problems, including decreased water quality, and we have big algal blooms that can be harmful, loss of seagrass habitat, low dissolved oxygen, lots of fish kills. Um, so lots of problems there. Um, but one of the ways that these shellfish can really help with grazing on plankton is by assimilating that excess nitrogen in the water into their tissue and shells. Um, and they can enhance sediment denitrification and bury it in seafloor sediments with their biodeposits. Um, and so as I sort of sort of reiterating here, but many states and towns are required to develop plans for how they will reduce excess nitrogen. Um, and so uh, there are plenty of people who want to incorporate this aspect of shellfish benefits into their, their plans. Um, so to date, aquaculture is the only practice uh, that is approved for nitrogen management in a few locations within the Northeast. Uh, however, uh, the Chesapeake Bay program is considering incorporating restoration aquaculture um, into their nitrogen management plans, uh, as opposed to just aquaculture for uh, harvest and sell. So this idea has been around for a while. Um, Officer et al. 1982 had a paper that benthic filter feeders are uh, natural eutrophication control. Um, restoration of oyster beds could reduce phenomena like anoxic zones, which Newell in 1988 proposed in their work. And then from an aquaculture perspective, uh, as early as 2005, Lindahl et al. Um, showed that longline mussel farming in Sweden could also help with this nitrogen problem. Peterson uh, et al. in 2014 did a full scale mussel farm in Denmark where they looked at how much nitrogen was removed. Um, Julie uh, in 2014 and her colleagues uh, wrote a paper for making a case for adding shellfish and nitrogen management plans. Um, and also the denitrification rates in aquaculture farms are similar to oyster reefs. Um, and Humphreys, who was at URI uh, and colleagues wrote about that in 2016. So this is not a new idea. Um, <clears throat> but how should we best help these towns and states incorporate shellfish into their nitrogen uh, management plans? And so modeling tools can be really helpful for that. Um, something that would predict nitrogen removal for locations that currently have limited to no shellfish aquaculture activity because the idea would be that a town is trying to zone um, its coastal waters. It doesn't necessarily have a lot of aquaculture yet, but maybe it could have more if they could see how much nitrogen uh, those those farms could remove. Um, and so what we can, in order to get somewhere with a modeling tool, we would need to know the measurement of bivalve feeding activities um, combined with like aquaculture farm stock, the practices of that farm, how many shellfish do you have, how often are they harvested, uh, and we can get an assessment of how much nitrogen a farm can remove. Um, and so there's a model that exists already called the farm model. Some of you are probably familiar with it. It's the farm aquaculture resource management model um, from, and this concept diagram is from Longline Environment who we're collaborating with. Um, so we can collect these data that I just talked about and I'm gonna go into detail, probably too much detail <laughs> about uh, the data we've collected for this so far um, to input it into this model. 
um, where we see what's coming into the shellfish farm um, and seeing what comes out uh, and what uh, just passes by. This is an example of a farm model output. Uh, one of my collaborators, Suzanne Bricker, has also done a lot of work with this model. Uh, these data, this is um, early results from a paper that just came out this year um, for Piscataqua River uh, in New Hampshire, uh, estimating the amount of um, ecosystem services and other benefits of shellfish farming um, uh, in, this, in this embayment. And river and so this is just an example to show you what kind of things that the um, that the model can can provide uh, related to people and and benefits and so for example here we have 105 PEQs per year and what that means is that alter oyster cultivation provides an ecosystem of servant equ equivalent to removal of nutrient discharge by 105 people so the waste of 105 people um, can be um, mitigated by oyster cultivation uh, at this site. And that's valued at about $4.2,000 per year. So this is just one example, and it's assuming a certain amount of nitrogen waste per year per person, or per person per year, so. Um, more on the model. These are all the different things we have to find out to put into the model if we want it to work for a specific location, which I will get to soon in the title I'd mentioned, Greenwich, Connecticut, and that is indeed where I'm going with all of this. But these are all the different things that we need to put in it, and it gives all these outputs of what to expect. Um, and one of the main uh, concerns about the farm model that's cropped up in the last few years is that it doesn't necessarily do a great job at, um, at getting the nitrogen part right. Uh, it's good at a lot of other, a lot of other outputs, but the nitrogen part, um, there's not necessarily enough data for um, these models that, that, are, that are local for a particular system. Because this model really works best if it's, you know, if you're talking about a specific bay, say in Ireland, for a specific species of clam, um, getting all those data is gonna give you the best possible predictions with the model. This uh, is a little bit more about what's embedded in the model. Aquashell, um, which uh, does growth simulation mass balance. Um, and so this is just showing you like all the different types of data that go into this to predict uh, this individual base model that is put into the farm um, to, to make the, the farm scale predictions. Um, so, all right. So the research project that I'd been working on for my postdoc uh, before I came to Roger Williams um, at Milford uh, was really cool because it, uh, just to give you an idea of how many people are involved in making this come together before I get into the, the actual project, uh, we worked with a lot of local stakeholders, including people who ran local neighborhood um, associations so that we could get access to sites to do our experiment. Here's uh, an example of a particular place we had to get special access to in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, and that the help of this guy and this guy, uh, Steve and Andy, we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and we worked with EPA and other water quality stakeholders, um, uh, Connecticut Department of Agriculture, and then our modelers are in the UK and Portugal, and then Suzanne Bricker's down in Maryland at the NOAA National Center for Coastal Ocean Science. So it's taken a lot of people to come together uh, to do this. And here's a nice picture of us when our, our modelers, uh, Alhambra and Suzanne, came out to see what it was like working in the field for a day and help us out with a few things. So our two big questions um, for this project in terms of what we need to feed into a farm model, um, specifically for Greenwich, Connecticut, are, are there differences in nitrogen availability and uptake in Greenwich, Connecticut over one year? So sampling once a month for 12 months. And then what are the rates of nitrogen assimilation, biodeposition and excretion of oysters during the growing season? Um, and these, these rates are, are uh, few and far between, I'll say. So it have been pretty important to get for the modeling efforts. 